There we go. Awesome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. How are you? It's uh, Ann Carey Ford calling in from Ojai, California, welcoming you to the next Q&A with John McIntosh. This one is titled The Rising Storm, and it's number 13 in the series that we've been doing. So if you're new to this broadcast, you can check out the former broadcast sequentially in a link that John's going to pop up right now. There it is. So um, feel free to go back and watch the other ones if you're so inclined. And uh, as always, if you have any questions or comments as we go along, you can put them in the comments section on the right hand side of your screen or and you can email John at globalpeaceweb at gmail.com. He loves to hear from you. So um, to introduce myself, my name is Ann Carey Ford, as I said, and um, I'd love to share with you my own website, voiceofdivinefeminine.com. I invite you to check that out and please reach out to me through the website. I'd love to hear from you. And um, I think most of you are very familiar with John McIntosh. Um, I think he's gonna pop up a link where you can find some of his books. Uh, so feel free to check that out. And um, I'd like to bring on John McIntosh right now to say a few words before we get going. Okay, thank you very much, Anne, uh, who uh, we are very grateful for uh, having as our hostess and uh, partner uh, in what seems to be organically evolving. Uh, uh, in uh, into morphing, we feel into something new, um, which will begin today. We're going to uh, shift the format of the uh, broadcast slightly, um, and uh, I'm going to very shortly here turn this back to uh, to Anne, who is going to um, uh, offer to us uh, something that she received, um, and uh, she'll she'll read it for us, and then we'll talk about it. And this is something we haven't done before, but we're going to see how this uh, new format at the beginning of, of the show um, uh, resonates with everyone. And you can let us know how you feel about it uh, in the comments or later through uh, through the email. Um, but uh, what we're what we're feeling is uh, that because of, uh, as as we've called it, the rising storm that is occurring all over the planet right now. Um, uh, there are a lot of what you might call quote unquote stories, uh, dramas, drama stories in people's lives that are unfolding, uh, certainly surrounded by, in most cases, fear, uh, but many other things so certainly affecting one's uh, life. In some cases, very, very difficult uh, situations are unfolding for some people. Um, and uh, this causes uh, a lot of question marks. Uh, it causes certainly a lot of fear with a lot of people, anxiety, what's going to happen to me, what's going to happen to my family. And, um, you know, the tendency of our broadcast is to focus as clearly and simply as possible on what is not true uh, by turning within um, rather than dwelling on the drama story of one's life, which is basically a dream. Uh, but uh, we've been uh, guided or influenced uh, to possibly include a little bit of uh, the story, which could be your story, could be other people's stories that you've heard about, um, as a preface to um, talking about uh, the story from the from the outside and also from the inside. So what I'm going to do is is give this back to Anne. Anne is going to uh, read what she received, and she'll tell you how she received it. Um, and then um, she's going to comment on it, and then I'll comment on it, and then we'll go to the questions after that. So, um, Anne, um, back to you, and uh, go ahead. So sometimes when I wake up, in the first thing in the morning, um, I'm inspired to get a pen and just start writing something down that I that is coming to me. And this is something that that came to me one morning. It was. Um, Pretty interesting, and I'm I'm just going to read it sort of like a monologue. Uh, so I'm going to jump in. 
Okay. I had the weirdest, most crazy dream last night. And it went something like this. There was this weird hypnotizing of everyone, sort of like a bad, cheap movie from the 60s, like, like a bad zombie kind of movie. Only this was modern day. And the scary part was that things seemed kind of normal and kind of not normal at the same time, but they were definitely not normal. Uh, but no one could really tell what normal was. Like, like kids could go to school, but they couldn't play with each other or hug each other because no one could breathe fresh air or touch each other. And this was sort of the new normal. But uh, because if you didn't have your mouth covered, you could kill someone else and not even know it. But the lack of oxygen made it hard to think clearly at all. And clearly, no one was thinking clearly. And as I said, things look kind of normal, but they weren't like, like no one had any money. Well, not no one, but lot, lots of people didn't have any money. And, but no one really talked about it because it was important to put up the appearance of being just fine so that the person who wasn't just fine wasn't ostracized as someone who was a failure, or didn't have a clue what to do next, or someone who didn't have a job or knew how to save for a rainy day or have a backup plan for rainy days. But the weird thing was that this was lots of people. I mean, lots and lots of people, like almost everyone in the same boat, so to speak, in the US anyway, all in the same boat. You could see it in people's eyes. That is, if you were looking for it. And, and you could tell that people were worried but it was hard to talk about because you had to stay six feet apart so you didn't touch each other. So no one was ever hugging because you could kill someone if you did. So no one was touching anyone. And some people hadn't been hugged for a really long time. So that added to the stress of having no job and no money, but people didn't talk about it. There were so many new rules to keep up with. And every day was a pretty exciting news day with all kinds of twists and turns. So everybody was feeling a little on edge and like they were going a little bonkers, but they, they couldn't put their finger on it. Everyone just wanted this nasty COVID thing to stop killing everyone. Thank God no one they knew had died from it. That Wait a second, wasn't, wasn't this killing everyone? Lots of people were dying, right? Yes, more and more people were dying every day. Pretty sure that's what they said. So we had to stay safe and stay away from each other and save lives so that we could go back to normal again, get our jobs back, go to concerts and football games. Uh, that'll be something to look forward to when we can go back to normal again after this horrible, pan horrible pandemic that's killed everyone that I personally know has been... Wait a minute. How does it figure that I don't know anyone personally that has died. Well, there was an actor that I heard of who died of COVID related. So I guess he counts as someone that I know. <laughs> anyway, we have to be sure this virus doesn't keep wiping out humanity as it could really spoil our plans of getting back to normal and the virus is the enemy. Uh, I'm afraid of getting it and giving it to anybody. So many people have died, even though I don't know any of them personally. I'm, pretty sure that viruses are evil particles that stick on stuff. So we have to wash our hands all the time. But I really don't know what a virus is, but I'm sure it's evil and we have to kill it before it kills us. Anyway, back to the weird dream that just seemed to go on and on. There were countless episodes and they just seemed to get weirder and weirder. And I almost knew that it was a dream that the dream was a dream. But anyway, here's another weird part. Everyone had different teams, but no one knew what team someone else was on. So they didn't talk about it in case the person they were talking to wasn't on the same team. So they didn't really talk about anything at all, except to say thank you to the checkout lady at the grocery store. Oh yeah, groceries had gotten really expensive, but it was weird. Nobody talked about it much. There was no time to think clearly about 
anything. And if you talk about stuff, you could expose yourself as someone who didn't have a friggin' clue what to do next, what the heck to do. And that could expose you as a, as a vulnerable person who didn't have answers and was feeling isolated, terrified. So what happened next in the dream? I, I started to feel this immense love for everyone. Things were so crazy and, and people were still so sweet and so beautiful. So I, I felt this immense love coming, pouring out of my heart for everyone. And then I woke up. So uh, before I say whatever I'm going to say here, um, I want to get um, your feedback on it. But I, but I have to I have to say something that just came to me. That I don't know how many are on this broadcast that might be old enough to remember a famous radio broadcast by Orson Welles called oh. The War of the Worlds. Um, and I, I was taken there as, as I'm listening because – there was enormous panic by many, many people listening to this broadcast that what he was reading was actually news that was being spoken of uh, out of uh, out of this um, H.G. Wells uh, novel, The War of the Worlds. Um, they perhaps didn't know about the book, uh, and uh, they you know picked the broadcast up uh, midstream, and they thought it was actually really happening. So there was a panic that occurred. An interesting metaphor. Uh, uh, Anne is uh, highly qualified in, in delivering, as you can see, um, uh, the written word in a variety of ways. Um, and uh, so I was struck by uh, how it, <laughs> it felt so real, the way she's explaining it, as if she was saying it off the top of her head rather than reading something that, that occurred to her a few days ago. Um, so uh, just uh, what is your feeling about uh, what you received? Well, it it wasn't a, it, it wasn't a dream that I actually had. This was something that came to me almost exactly the way I, I read it, um, and it occurred to me that it was a, a a very skillful way of putting out the um, dreamlike quality of what the collective is experiencing maybe on social media, posting it on social media, which I did um, without, um, without being one step removed by prefacing it by saying I had the weirdest dream last night um, because all it was that was in the, in the content that I read was a description of what's actually going on <laughs> everywhere as far as I can tell. So I thought it was interesting. It was almost like an instruction to me of how to um, get through to people and maybe present a question mark for them to question their uh, so-called reality so that they didn't um, buy it hook, line, and sinker. So this is definitely how um, source um speaks to us uh, through metaphor, although this was, uh, it's a real stretch to even call this a metaphor. Right? It's, it's almost a description of what's going on. So let me just then uh, go into uh, what I'm feeling. Um, emphasizing as I do um, uh, uh, frequently, uh, what we're experiencing on the planet um, you could say in the universe, but on the planet and specifically in your life, what you see on television and, um, and online and radio, if you listen to radio, I don't know if anybody listens to radio except for music anymore, but anyway, that's certainly online and, uh, on television, uh, and out on the street and, and, uh, out and about, um, this is the reality that a sleeper calls real. In truth, it's a dream, but as it becomes more poignant, as it becomes, you could call more stressful, uh, more questionable, uh, because uh, there isn't a clear uh, delineation of, of where to go, what to do, what to say. Um, the rules seem to be changing all the time. 
there is the possibility of getting pulled even deeper into the dream, even though you know better. In most cases, people that are listening to this right now or, or will later uh, know that this is a dream. They, they know it from a mental standpoint, but it has not yet uh, reached the stage for most people uh, that it is a heart knowing. When you've reached the stage where, where it's a heart knowing that this is a dream, you're free. And I've uh, mentioned before many times that you're free usually with baggage. You have a lot of conditioning, attachments, expectations, and identifications that make up who you believe you are and make up the, the, the false world that we believe is real. Um, but you're free because you know it's a dream. Absolutely. In the heart, you know it. Uh, but you keep getting pulled back onto the stage by the conditioning. And this waffles back and forth. It can for lifetimes. But um, uh, for anyone that has made the choice to be free, no matter what, in capital letters, um, they, they tend not to stay on the stage very much when they get pulled back on because they catch themselves very quickly um, and realize that, oh, I got caught by that that conditioning, by that attachment, by that expectation, by that identification. And, and they sort of jump back down uh, into the audience again as a, as a witness of what's going on. What happens when uh, the dream becomes agitated as it is now? Um, is it, there's a tendency for those that have not yet made the heart connection to the dream, that they know for sure that it's a dream, there's a tendency to get pulled back into the dream and, um, and, and to be there in some cases for some time suffering because it seems so believable. And then they might get reminded by something they read or somebody they talk to or something like this broadcast that, oh, it's, it's just a dream. Uh, but until it's a heart centered thing, uh, it can feel incredibly uh, real and very, very terrifying. So there's a confusion that happens. I don't know how to handle this. And as one uh, um, a person that wrote in a few days ago, uh, this can lead to things like uh, uh, meltdown and suicide, unless someone turns within, makes the turn within consciously and says, I choose to be free no matter what, uh, there can be a, a total breakdown. And, uh, and this is definitely what's happening uh, with many people. Now the breakdown, uh, is a breakthrough if you allow it. And by a breakthrough, what I mean is, and this is what happened to me in 1999 when I jumped off the, the cliff of the dream and dove into the, the pathless path to freedom, is the, the uh, choice uh, to look at anything, no matter what it is, as a mirror for who you are not. Instead of looking at it as real, um, uh, you can look at the masks that people are wearing. Uh, you can look at the social distancing that, that people are experiencing. Um, uh, you can look at the broadcasts that are, are talking about uh, a meltdown of the economy. Um, and you can look at these, certainly from the standpoint that it's affecting your, your physical reality, which is not reality, it's an illusion, but it feels real. But you can look at it from the standpoint of what is this telling me about who I am not? That's the, the incredible gift that exists in a very stressful, high, high anxiety environment, such as the world is experiencing right now. And for some, it's, it's, it's excruciatingly that way. Um, and then uh, if you're inclined, if you resonate with it, to use self-inquiry to say, well, who is it that is experiencing this high anxiety, this fear, this trepidation, possibly physical anomalies that are occurring uh, because of the, the high stress that you're holding? Then uh, the question uh, is answered with always only with the one word, me. Who is it? It's me. You never add to that. You just say, it's me. And then the question is followed by another question, who am I? Um, you're not looking for an answer. Um, you're not looking for something made up that you read about. You are allowing grace, which is love and action, another word for the self, another word for the real you to shine light on who you are not. And in this case, uh, let's say it's called uh, anxiety or fear. And maybe it's a very specific fear. What will I do if I don't get some money pretty soon? Uh, what will I do if, I, if, if I'm physically incapacitated, I can't even make it to the grocery store? You know, this kind of fear, very tangible. 
Um, and uh, the question is, uh, who is it that's feeling this? Me. And uh, who am I? And, um, and then th this shines light on an aspect of the conditioning that defines who you have believed you are. And it basically melts or burns up that layer of conditioning, which has created, pardon me, has manifested the illusion of this as an aspect of your identity. And if this is done on a regular basis and the opportunity for it to be done on a regular basis exists when there are many, many, many examples, mirrors everywhere surrounding you all over the place that you can't miss. Uh, when these opportunities are there, you have many opportunities to go through this exercise of who's actually feeling this? Me. Who am I? And what's happening is incredibly powerful in dissolving that which has veiled or hidden the real you from you. I'm not saying that the experience is not being felt or that you're not, if you're, if you're still sleeping to the truth, suffering from certainly in pain, uh, very inconvenient for many, uh, but the opportunity that lies behind it and the purpose of it, the specific purpose of it, because everything is orchestrated for your freedom, everything. There's nothing that isn't orchestrated uh, in the universe for your freedom. Uh, that's what it's all about. Um, so there are many, many opportunities, far more than you may have had in your entire lifetime, can occur in a week uh, for you to look at who you are not, which is keeping you uh, bound in a prison called the false self, um, the, the person that you have called me. So um, it's a wonderful time to be alive, an exciting time to be alive, a terrifying time for many to be alive, uh, but the opportunity for freedom, real freedom, which is the, the full recognition of the self, the God that you are, the opportunity has never been greater, uh, perhaps in the entire history of the planet, and even the history is a dream, but let's just say that there is a history in the entire history of the planet. It may be the single greatest opportunity for one to, to shift from deep dreaming to absolute freedom um, in a matter of, of weeks or months, certainly years, if you continue to uh, focus on who you are not through, and I'm suggesting if it resonates with, uh, through self-inquiry, which is the, the, the direct route uh, to freedom or any other method that, that suits you. So, uh, uh, Anne, let's uh, move into the questions and see what we've got for this week. John, can I add one little comment to what you just said? Um, I used to study lucid dreaming and they were called cues when you were dreaming. If you wanted to wake up in your dream, if things were a little off, like you look down at your hand and you have six fingers instead of five or something mm. like that. And so when things are off, it, it almost pronounces the dream even more like like people are standing really far apart from each other why you know like something things are really different so um i just wanted to add that, that yeah that's, no that's great that's it's, it's very surreal you're right very surreal <laughs> at least where i live anyway uh let's get into the questions um the first question is from nirvana who wants to know, when I choose freedom, no matter what, can I be in the fire of who I am not without getting, without being molested by it? Why I am not free fully from the conditioning? Why, while I am not free fully from the conditioning? Right. Okay. Um, yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> but, uh, oops, no. Uh, what happens when you choose freedom, no matter what? as I did um, when I jumped off the cliff um, of, the, of the dream on January 5th, 1999, I keep repeating, that day, I didn't know I was doing it. But in, in um, hindsight, um, that's what was happening. I was, I was saying, yes, I choose freedom and I'll do anything to be free, which is <laughs> ultimately what happened. Every, the wealth that I had, the freedom I had, uh, in the material world, um, which was considerable, uh, completely disappeared in a very short period of, of clock time. Um, and in that clock time, which is about 
two and a half years, uh, I went through enormous suffering. Um, and, and when I say suffering, suffering is only possible when you believe in victims and victims only uh, a possible um, a belief system. It's an illusion, but a belief system when you believe in separation. So I was still uh, experiencing a, a belief in separation uh, for that period of time. So I was definitely suffering as, as my uh, empire uh, dissolved and my life uh, melted down. So for anyone that has made this choice, they're standing in the fire of who they are not. Um, for example, uh, you are not a person, body, mind, identity. You are not a person. You have, you, the self, capital letters, has a body, uh, but you are not a body. You have a mind, which is like an operating system and computer, but you are not the mind. Uh, the mind is supposed to be the servant of the self, but it's actually the dictator of the self while one is dreaming, while one believes that you are a body-mind identity called me, a person named, uh, in my case, it was John McIntosh. So uh, when you are facing trigger after trigger, which as we've just said, there are many opportunities to look at, at triggers now in the mirror of the world that you're experiencing, when you experience this over and over again, and you don't run from it, you don't sedate um, in the various ways we can sedate, uh, you don't distract from it and say, oh, well, I'll get to that later. You stand in the fire of what you're looking at, and you allow it to wash over you, wash over your awareness, and this is very painful. So it's not just molesting you, it's, it's attacking you. Uh, because it wants to stay alive. When you are so-called free, when you know who you are, and when your conditioning has been reduced to certainly echoes and more likely just whispers, there's hardly any left, and you're, you're in the dream, but not of the dream, as, as most people are aware of that, that uh, ancient uh, adage, um, then the, it's like you're in the eye of the storm. And, and the, the dream can no longer molest you, as I wrote in an article that uh, I think uh, stimulated this uh, question uh, a couple of days ago. Um, it's there, but it's not molesting you because there's nothing for it to stick to. For example, uh, someone says something to you that in the past, when you were dreaming, offends you. Maybe they've said, well, uh, you know, your, your, your father was a terrible person. Um, uh, you know, I was your next door neighbor and, and I saw what he did to his family and, you know, he was a drunkard and, and he didn't provide for his family and he beat his children and, and then he left everybody and he was just a monster. And uh, depending on where your awareness level is, you may even then defend the father if you're dreaming. And in that defense, you may become offended by the criticism. You're allowed to criticize, but that person is that sort of thing. Um, and, and there are you know, millions of ways that you can be offended when you are attached to certain beliefs or identities or expectations. That's not a possibility when you're the self because you're not attached to anything. If someone tries to offend you, it just rolls off your shoulders because it doesn't stick to anything. Uh, someone wants to call you a jerk, okay. Uh, they they, they want to say you're stupid, all right, that's fine, because there is no you for it to stick to. So you can't be molested by the dream, you see? Uh, but when there is something there, and if it triggers you uh, and you're free, then we'll call that either baggage, an echo, or a whisper, depending on how much conditioning you still have left. So if something triggers you, then what a blessing. It's showing you. It's like turning over every stone. It's showing you something that you were unaware of uh, that was, let's say, very deeply hidden within you uh, that is still conditioning that's sticking to you. So thank you, God. It's wonderful that, painful, but it's wonderful that that trigger, which can be the mirror of your world, the circumstances in your world, well, it, it always comes from there, from the mirror of your world, it triggers you and it perhaps causes you to react. And depending on how much conditioning you have, you may react for some time, uh, clock time. 
uh, or it might just come and go very, very quickly when you don't have much conditioning left. So uh, a very clear no. When you are standing in the fire of who you are not, your life gets much more difficult. And when I say much more difficult, uh, think in terms of the Richter scale. When you go from one to two uh, and then two to three, the distance between two to three is not the same as the distance between one to two. That's not how the Richter scale works. It's exponentially greater. Three, three, uh, three to four is exponentially greater than two to three. Uh, and that's how it works. It's like comparing one to 10 when you go from a full dreamer that just believes everything they see to someone that has committed 100% to surrender to the world and uh, all the mirrors that, that uh, show uh, the conditioning that is still sticking, uh, you're, you're in an environment that's constantly on fire and constantly in earthquakes. This is why so many people don't make the choice and many that do back out of it. Uh, it's death. It's death of the identity, not death of the body, death of the identity, which is the false self. So the absolute unequivocal no, when you're standing in the fire of who you are not, it's hell, uh, but it's quick. Um, and then when you are free, you can no longer be molested by the dream, except for, as I said, whispers come up and that that's very very quick not the answer you probably want to hear but <laughs> that's the way it is i'm gonna read um a comment from layla i think she wants you to um give her feedback the self is everywhere right i just feel i'm melting in this existence it's a very strange feeling hmm. uh this is uh, absolutely beautiful uh, when one uh, has their priority, their number one attention is on freedom. I like to use the word freedom. You can call it self-realization. Uh, you can call it awakening, but not the awakening uh, that most people uh, believe is awakening. This is awakening to the self, to the God that you are um, in an unbroken stream uh, so that it's your only experience. When you are interfacing that experience, which is the normal experience, the normal state, the true state of who you really are, uh, the false self can feel literally like it's melting. Um, and this can be very surreal, like what's going on in the world right now is very surreal compared to what you experienced a year, a year ago, even six months ago. Um, and so uh, it, it's like uh, I'm not who I used to be. Um, I used to think this and I don't think that anymore, or, or I don't think anything about it anymore. Things that used to interest me, um, they, they've just faded. Things that I was passionate about have completely dissolved. Uh, who am I? Uh, I mean, we're asking this in self-inquiry, but that, that can be a question that, that can come up when you're melting into the real you, the self, you can very often feel like I am disappearing. It's exactly, not a metaphor, it's exactly what's happening. You are melting, you, the false self, the false body, mind, identity, false self is melting. And that's like clouds hiding the sun are dissolving. And the real you, the sun, which has never left, has always been there, never not been there, is being revealed to itself. So it's an exquisitely beautiful aspect of, you could call it the final days of dreaming. Um, so that, that's, it's wonderful to hear that from someone when they're saying that. I think she's on this broadcast right now, actually. Uh, hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and thank you for that statement. Um, this question is from Loni, who says, when Jesus saw the Pharisees and recognized the darkness within them, does that mean that he was projecting that darkness and they reflecting back at him? Mm -hmm. This is a really, really good question. Um, I have said that your world is a mirror of who you are not. So it would seem like this question is correct, that um, Jesus was looking at the Pharisees and they were liars and cheaters. And <laughs> you could say that yeah, they're here again. And, uh, you know, where are they? Well, they're mostly in the media. 
because hardly anything in the media that uh, you're being told, including all this uh, nonsense about uh, uh, a pandemic, uh, it's, it's just not true at all. Uh, and I won't go into great detail on that because they tend not to like to hear that. Um, but um, uh, what did he look at? Was he looking at himself? Was he projecting himself on them and then seeing the reflection of it? No. When one has achieved, in his case, full self-realization, like a Buddha, um, like uh, uh, more recently Ramana, uh, Master Ramana, um, uh, totally without conditioning, not even whispers of any kind, then the world that they're looking at is a dream. They see the dream clearly, totally clearly. Uh, and in the moment, without judgment, and he certainly never judged, without judgment, they can see what needs to be addressed, if anything, if they're not sort of sitting or living or uh, existing in silence, which would certainly be the case for anyone that is totally free a lot of the clock time. Um, they are looking at the dream and addressing whatever is next, because they'll know in the moment spontaneously what's next to address. And they may even castigate, as, as he was said to have done, castigate the, the Pharisees or the, uh, the leaders of the Sanhedrin, the, the uh, 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 religious faction uh, at the time that, where he was, um, and tell them that they were, for example, hypocrites, as he did. In his heart, he saw himself as the real them, so-called them. He knew there are no others. I don't mean the body-mind expression that, that uh, was speaking to him, let's say, or condemning him, let's say, but the God within them, which is within everything, the rocks, the trees, the insects, the birds, the sky, the universe, the clouds, the, the, the star systems, everything is the self in a garment of conditioning projected on the screen of consciousness, which is just God projecting an image, a dream, um, on itself so that it could play in the field of dreams and experience itself fully um, because it can't know itself any other way. It's one. It's empty. It's nothing. How does it know itself? It has to have a projection to, to look at, to play within, and then steps into the holographic experience of it. So he was not looking at himself because he knew unequivocally that it was a dream. He was looking at the dream calling the dream what it was in whatever way was appropriate in the moment, but also at the same time, in an unbroken stream, loving unconditionally the truth, which was him, which is the self, the God, the I am, uh, that existed both within the dream and also surrounding the dream. Because uh, one is one. You can't have anything outside outside one so everything is actually in one in consciousness in the self but it appears to be outside so he was looking at the truth but he was making whatever statement that he was making might have been a condemnation of hypocrisy in the moment uh at the dream speaking to the dream and saying you know th this is not real and whatever words were used but at the same time loving it and that's how the self uh responds uh, to the dream, it loves it, uh, but it but it calls it out and calls it you know what it really is. This next question is from Hestel. John, kindly ex please explain physical pain, for example, arthritis or sciatica, etc., and how to deal with it. She adds much gratitude to you for your infinite knowledge, which you share so lovingly. Well, thank you for that. Um, there is a, uh, certainly a very, very popular belief, uh, system within, particularly within various spiritual circles. And this can include, uh, diehard religious beliefs that are very stringent and rigid. Uh, some call it fundamentalism. Uh, it doesn't matter which belief system it is. Um, it's like, this is the way and there is no other way that, that kind of fundamental uh, belief system. Uh, that within uh, the belief system, there can be what's called healing. And the healing uh, very often can, can be um, 
uh, from an outside source. Uh, a faith healer of uh, alternative medicine uh, and techniques, or it could be through allopathic drugs and surgery, um, or it could be a combination of all of them uh, wrapped around by, let's say, prayer, meditation, thought projection, all of these things. Um, and all of those things do and have had and are having a significant influence on pain and suffering. Let's call it physical pain like arthritis or sciatica. Um, and in some cases, a total remission of the condition. And so this, of course, can, can bring many to the belief that, oh, this works. This is the way. This belief system is the way. This healing technique is the way. No, it isn't. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you. No, it isn't. There is no way um, that uh, uh, pain and suffering and sickness can be um, dissolved except through the, the, the desolation of the conditioning, expectations, attachments, and identifications tied to memory and imagination. The desolation of conditioning that caused the illness. And it doesn't have to be arthritis. It could be a car accident. It could be a stroke. It could be financial meltdown. It could be a divorce. It can be all of those things combined. And many, many more. These things manifest as a direct, direct relation, indirect relationship to whatever conditioning you came in with. Um, and until that conditioning is dissolved, uh, the condition that it manifested is not going to be limited. Even if someone uh, reaches the stage where they are self-realized, where there's no conditioning at all, not even whispers, they may still experience physical anomalies. For example, Nisargadatta, the master Nisargadatta, who was self-realized, Ramana, who was self-realized, they both died of cancer. Their bodies died of cancer, but their bodies are not who they are. But their bodies have their own separate identity, their own separate uh, destiny, I should say, um, that was manifested out of previous conditioning. And it's like taking your foot off the accelerator in a car. Um, the momentum will continue the car forward until inertia brings it to a halt. And that might not be until the body leaves the I should say the self leaves the body and uh, the body falls away. Or it might be that that individual, uh, whoever became self-realized, uh, found their body in perfect, robust health. That's a possibility as well. Or maybe it was always in perfect, robust health and, and the conditioning manifested as circumstances rather than through physical uh, ailments and illnesses and diseases. The... Uh, the presence of illness is a reflection on the mirror of who you are not, giving you the opportunity to look at who you're not and to dissolve it, dissolve the conditioning, um, ideally through self-inquiry, uh, so that the self is revealed. So it's a blessing when you have these things, but it's a very difficult way of seeing who you're not, ideally, um, and Usually, once you have made the choice to be free, no matter what, um, you'll find that the ways and means that you become aware of who you're not are, are, are generally more gentle. Uh, but you could still have chronic arthritis while you're receiving other mirrors showing you that you're not this, you're not that, you're not this other thing. And you basically just say yes to the condition, because it is happening. You don't resist it. That's what causes suffering. You say yes to it, and you are given, always, when you've made the no matter what choice to be free, you are given the endurance that you perhaps didn't have before. Certainly, the complaining will disappear. You won't be complaining anymore because you're not a victim anymore. Um, that doesn't mean you're not in pain, but you're not suffering. Because you know you're not a victim. You know there's no such thing as separation, which brings about the belief in victims. But you can still be in really significant pain. You do whatever you're guided to do. And that can be pain relievers. It can be various techniques. It can be alternative medicine. It can be drugs and surgery. Whatever you're guided to do, you do that. 
but you may have that the rest of your life, clock time, body life, which is not really life, it's just a dream, uh, while the self is being revealed to itself through the experience of your world, including the physical anomalies. You certainly don't need to learn from the um, uh, disease, let's say it's arthritis, that, that continues and the pain continues. You don't need to learn through that because you've already learned through it. It's just the momentum of the conditioning from past experiences that you brought in with this life that have to burn out on their own like the momentum and the inertia in a car, as I explained before. So you might have them and you might not have them. Uh, the body has its own destiny. But you certainly can be totally free and still have a body that, that has certain um, illnesses and discomforts. Uh, we have one more question on my list. This is from Pam, who says, John, this final shift, when it happens, is it always suddenly or is it progressive or maybe both? Hmm. Okay. Um, the shift... Um, is in uh, the process right now. Um, it has, uh, you could say it's been interfacing for perhaps 100, 150 years. Um, and I've referred to it as um, the shift from the dysfunctional um, divine masculine patriarchy to become dysfunctional. Um, it's been around for around 11,000 years. It's become dysfunctional, dream years. Um, and uh, for about the last 150 years, the divine feminine has been influencing, you could say, balancing um, the dysfunctional divine masculine uh, through uh, many, many different ways and means. And, and you can look back to, let's say, women's uh, suffrage and, and, and the vote. You can look to women in, in business. You can look at uh, the changes in fashion, depending on what country you're in. Um, you can look at um, uh, women uh, taking positions of, of power and influence. Um, uh, there are many, many instances of the divine feminine expressing itself, and certainly through uh, art and, and, and music, um, uh, which includes things like sculpture and architecture and so on. The, the, um, the feminine, divine feminine influence has, has expanded dramatically in the last 150 years. And this has been a balancing influence on the, on the dysfunctional divine masculine. So that is the great shift. Uh, but as it approaches uh, the neutral phase, which it moved into just a handful of years ago, where uh, you could call it the age of light, where the divine feminine and divine masculine are essentially ostensibly um, uh, balanced for a, a period of clock time, a season, a couple of thousand years. Um, then uh, the remaining aspect of the dysfunctional patriarchy, um, what I call the house of cards, uh, collapses. And if you look around, um, and you don't have to look far right now, that's what's happening. It's collapsing. And when it collapses, there is chaos. And there is also a last gasp attempt to hang on to the tyrannical dictatorship that it's that it's held over uh, the world and humanity for thousands of years, uh, mostly unseen, uh, just accepted, because certainly the divine feminine was totally suppressed. Um, and, uh, and it does this through various ways and means. Right now, we have a, what some people call the deep state, manifesting all over the world, a number of nefarious uh, actions um, uh, attempting to destroy the economy, um, uh, draw people apart, ideally get rid of most of the population. That's depopulation is another part of it. And a, and a, a host of other things that are part of the story, which we don't go into in a lot of detail, but we touched on it at the beginning of this one. Um, this is all part of the collapse, and it most definitely is collapsing because it's a dream that has shifted into this age of light, this, this balanced neutral phase that we're, of course, we're not feeling it. We're feeling the opposite of it right now. Um, you can say, you know, 10 years ago, it was much more balanced than it is now. Well, no, you just weren't aware of the imbalance. You're just seeing the imbalance now in a very stark 
contrast to the way life used to be, which people will call normal. It wasn't normal at all. If you're dreaming, you're not living a normal life. Normal is when you're totally aware of the God you are, of the self. So the shift has been taking place for about 150 years, and it will go on for, for quite some time. Uh, but you may have shifted into the total awareness of the self that you are, so you won't experience it as a shift because the expansion of the conscious awareness of the God you are, the truth, the self you are, whatever you want to call it, has, has or will have happened for you. And so even if it's still going on for the rest of the world for some time, uh, here and there, uh, you will be in the eye of the storm. Uh, so it's a question of how quickly the conditioning dissolves and the clouds are cleared and the awareness of who you really are occurs for you and stays that way, mostly. Um, you know, if you still have some whispers of conditioning, they'll be a, a little bit back and forth on the stage, but not much. You won't be on the stage. You'll just recognize uh, the dream for a few moments and then you'll uh, and then you'll come catch yourself very quickly. Um, so it depends on how quickly you become fully aware of who you really are as to how much influence or effect um, the shift has on you. But the, the shift is in full sway right now, big time. Um, and uh, everyone is being touched by it except those that are free. Uh, they recognize it. They see it. They experience it. But, the, but they're not molested by it uh, because they're free of it. They're in the dream, but not of the dream, literally, not just a nice little catch phrase uh, that you've used. They're actually experiencing that, those that, that are, are free. Well, John, I'd love to add my two cents about chaos. Or five cents, 25 cents. Okay. <laughs> we'll see how, many, how much sense it makes. <laughs> yeah. Um, chaos uh, stirs up reference points. So things are not the same. And I think our conditioned mind perceives sameness as safety. So our knee jerk reaction is to go into fight or flight, go into fear because we don't, because we're in a, a place of uncertainty during chaos. But when I stopped and thought about that, you know, really took a good look at that, I realized that everything was always uncertain anyway, that there was no telling, even if you're sitting in meditation in your house, the roof could fall in, that could happen. Uh, anything can happen at any time. So um, having this time of chaos when things are stirred up when reference points are dissolving, you could say, it seems like it's an opportunity to regard chaos as opportunity to um, to consider the um, the uncertainty as um, an adventure like it's always been like that but now it's more apparent that that there is no there is no certainty <laughs> and uh, I personally look at it like um, like an like an adventure you know um, absolutely. It, that it's um, always been like that. It's just now it's obviously like yes, that. Yes, yes, yeah. That's absolutely true. And uh, it's called em embracing the unknown um, mm -hmm. uh, because there is no certainty of, of anything except that you are God. You are the self. Um, uh, I, I think I've used this example before when I was a kid uh, playing the game of uh, standing up stiff and falling backwards and someone's supposed to catch you before you crash to the ground. It's that kind of faith, uh, trust, if you like, uh, that uh, the unknown, the God that you are, that you're unaware of, will catch you before you crash and burn. Um, that's embracing the unknown no matter what. So um, that's what's going on now, and you're absolutely right. This is a major adventure, and if you look at it like that, even though it can be very uncomfortable, very challenging, and painful, uh, it's definitely uh, the best time to be alive right now. No matter what seems to be, the truth is that you are God. You are free. You're the self, and that's why we're here. <laughs> yeah. So 
thank you, and uh, you're more than welcome to uh, uh, send us your comments on this slight revision of our format. Uh, let us know if you want more of it, uh, and if you'd like to indeed uh, participate. It may be that you'd like to actually come on the show, uh, be a part of it, and tell your story if you want to, um, uh, which we would probably put at the beginning, and then have a little dis uh, chat, a little discussion about it. Um, you would write us what your story is first, then we'd probably choose one, uh, bring someone on if you feel comfortable with that, and then we'd have a little chit-chat about it, and, and uh, then go into our questions. If you like that idea, let us know, and then we'll go from there. So thank you so much for being with us, and thank you, Anne, for being the fabulous hostess that you are. You. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's always a joy to be with uh, all of you, and, and lots and lots of love. Hi, everyone. <laughs> See you next there, week. There we go. It's there. <laughs> See you next week.